Hello and welcome to Console Cowboys. So if you liked the last video where we were signing transactions with Python and the video where we were interacting with ERC20 smart contracts on mainnet, you're gonna love this video because we're gonna go really, really, really deep compared to those. We have a local bank contract that we're gonna interact with in a bunch of different ways so that by the end of this video, you should be able to interact with Python with any smart contract you're testing in various different ways. And this is gonna set you up to hack around on any smart contract. So if you're excited about that, then give me a like below, subscribe, and you can grab my Twitter in the description below. Give me some love there. I also appreciate any and all comments because it helps the YouTube algorithm. And thank you to everybody who's been sharing this out in your social media. Let's hop right into it. On the screen, I have our connection code from our last video, which connected to our local Ganache blockchain on port 7545. I also have Ganache already running because we're going to use that again. And I have our connect to contract code, which is from our interact with ERC20 token, all I've done is remove the address because we're no longer communicating with the mainnet on the chain link contract. We're communicating with our local blockchain because we're gonna be doing a lot of things that would cost us money on the main chain. So we need the address and the ABI of the contract that we're gonna to communicate to. And where is that found? Well, I have it in the description below. You can download it off GitHub. And this is our old buddy, Hello World Bank from the previous smart contract hacking course that I'm using in this Web3 hacking course so that we can go through and learn how to communicate with all the things that you could think of in a contract, which will give you the confidence to start hacking around and interacting with any other contract. I've also added a ton of functionality into this. I added functionality that would really allow you to interact with this in the most ways possible. So we have some private variables some public variables, we set up a owner that uses authorization here with a modifier. We also have an event that kicks off when certain things happen so we can monitor those later with some async programming. We have a way to change our private variables. We have a deposit function to deposit ether to the contract. We also have a withdraw function to pull our money out. We have a withdraw all function that takes all the money out. And we have a get balance function that gets our balance. So this should allow us to learn how to code Python to interact with a lot of different things in a contract that we would be faced with. And by the end of this, you should really have the skill set to start playing around with contracts and start hacking around on them and doing all the vulnerabilities from the last smart contract course in Python. So how do we get the address and the ABI for this contract? Well, we need to deploy and compile this. So if we hop over on the side and we hit compile hello world bank, it'll be compiled. And then what we can do is we can deploy it, but we don't wanna deploy it to the default. We need to deploy it to our local Ganache blockchain. So if you scroll down, you're gonna see something that says dev Ganache provider. And when you click that, it's going to be set up for the text space one, which runs on 8545. I showed you in the last video in Linux. We need to just change that to 7545 because that's what the GUI one is working on. Unless you are using the text space one, then just leave it alone and it should work just fine. I'm gonna hit okay. Once it's ready to go, you saw it loaded up this, which has all of our ether 99.98, 100, which matches up what I have here. And that's just from me deploying it a few minutes ago. It has a little less on that first one. So I'm gonna hit deploy now. And it's gonna to deploy to our blockchain. So you're gonna see, okay, this goes down to 99.97 because it used some ether when it deployed. If you hop in the transactions, you'll see where I deployed it, right? So that's all of those interactions. And below you will have your hello world contract. And you should be familiar with this all because you're coming from the smart contract hacking course where we did this a lot. But this is just a quick refresher because I did put that out a while ago. Here's all your functionality in the contract if you wanna play around with this before you start hacking with Python. And I do suggest that you go through this whole contract, understand what it's doing, it's pretty simple, and then play around with it like a regular person would uh, within Remix and see how all the functionality works. Then hop back in here and we will do it in Python. But we can grab the address for this contract right here by clicking that. And let's paste that inside of our code right within this target address. 
Now all we need is this ABI. Now the ABI is a little bit trickier because if you go in here and you go to your compile tab, you can just click ABI. However, this is gonna take up a lot of real estate in your code and make it harder to navigate your code. I will show you right now. This is just nasty. So we're not gonna play around with this. We're gonna hit Control Z and we're gonna grab it from a different location, which will make it easier. So we're gonna hit Compilation Details. We're gonna hit Web3 Deploy and we're just gonna grab this whole first line. I can just click it a few times so it highlights, hit Control C and let's paste it in our ABI. And now it's gonna be all in one line. All we have to do is remove everything up until the parentheses on that end. And the exact same thing on the other end, I'm gonna click right here, grab everything including that parentheses, kill it, and then it should work just fine. And now it looks a hell of a lot better in our code and you won't get as confused trying to navigate around your code, which is fantastic. So now what we have is we have a connection to our local blockchain. We have a connection to our contract. Let's start off by learning some more web3.py stuff, which is gonna help us in these scripts when we're hacking around. So first off, how do we print out the first and second account that we're using in the blockchain? Let's do that. Because then we can do it programmatically instead of just copy pasting it in here. So all we have to do is say web3.eth.accounts and we can put whatever value we want in here. Let's do zero. And then I'm gonna copy paste this and I'm going to put in one. And much like programming, counting starts with zero. So zero and one would be account one and two. So we can print that out here and you'll see that it comes back with B9 and 4B. So if we look at our Ganache accounts, we have B9 and we have 4B. So those are our first two accounts. We can load those into our uh, scripts automatically. Now, another thing that pops up sometimes is let's say we deploy this contract on Remix with our first account. Well, the default account our script is gonna use when we're sending things and we're making interactions is gonna be that first account, account zero. But if we deploy with that and we're testing if we can bypass things, we wanna use account two. So how do we set that as the default for all of our stuff after that? Well, that's actually pretty easy as well. So here's what we can do. We can say web3.eth.default underscore account. And we'll say that's just equals this up here. We'll say account number two here, which is denoted as one. And now what happens is everything in the script after this, if we don't specify something specifically of what account we're using, we're gonna be using the second account, which is not the one that deployed it, which means it's not the owner of the account and we shouldn't have access to things that are protected by only owner. So that'll just help you when you try and test your contracts just to make sure that you know, you're using the right account. It's a good way to do it. So now let's talk about interacting with the contract at hand. Let's start out right in the top of our contract and understand some stuff. So we have a public variable address named owner. We have a private string named message. What is the difference between those two? Well, if we hit this deploy and run transactions, we come down here and open this up right here just like that. You're gonna see buttons for all of the public functions and for the public variable. So there's one for owner here. It'll give us the owner of this contract is the one we deployed it with. But there is no button for message because message is private and we shouldn't have access to that directly. Now, we know that the value is hello because we set it in the constructor and we can see the source code. But what happens when somebody changes the message? We don't have access to it. And if this was sensitive values and we wanted to access that, then we could access it because if you understand how contract memory works, the storage memory, here is slot zero and here is slot one. So although there's no functionality to call this contract, we can access it via the storage. And I'll put out a deep dive video next on how contract storage works with private variables, et cetera. But for now, just trust me and we're gonna see how to call that with Python, which also will help you if you're trying to do the Ethernet challenges, stuff like that, and you need to access private memory. This is how, gonna be how you do it in Python. So let's grab that right out of memory. We'll say web3.eth.get storage at. And then where are we gonna get storage from? We're gonna get it from our target 
address right up here. We set this address. We're going to grab target address. And we want to grab the second memory slot, which will be one because we count zero, one. And we'll say decode because we want to decode it. Otherwise, it's going to look funky with a bunch of hex. And let's wrap this in a print statement so we can print it out. And what we should get back now is we're grabbing the second slot in memory. So here's zero, here's one. That's the second slot in memory. And we're going to print it out to the screen. So let's do that now by running our program. We should get back our two addresses again, and then we should get hello. And we did, right? So we pulled the value directly out of the storage of memory inside the contract that you should not have access to. So just another thing to understand about contract memory, right? Now, like I said, in the next video, I'll go a deep dive on that a little bit. But now let's talk about how do we change this? So when we were interacting with the chain link contract, we would call the function, we use dot call. But now we're gonna send data to the contract and make a change. So we're gonna use a dot transact. So how do we do that? Well, let's set up a variable to hold our hash when we make the transaction. We'll call it transaction hash. And then we'll say that equals target which is our contract up here. So we wanna do dot functions, just like when we were using the chain link contract in the old video, dot the name of the function, change message. And then what does change message take? Well, if we look at the code here, change message takes a string called my message. So we need to send that a string. So let's do that. Let's just change it to test. So it's going to change from hello to test, and then we have to do dot transact after it instead of dot call, because like I said, we're sending data and we're making that change. We're not just pulling data back like we did in the chain link contract. And I mentioned that when we were doing that, that this is another way to do it when we're doing something, you know, rather than just pulling data. So now once we do that, it should change the value to test in the storage memory. But Let's take that transaction hash and wait for this transaction to end before we start accessing everything. We can do that with web 3eth for transaction receipt because if we were on the blockchain, this transaction, you know, it might take a little bit of time because it has to mine the transaction, whereas here it's going to be really quick on our local blockchain, but just something to think about. We're going to wait for the transaction with the TX underscore hash. And once we do that, then we can do whatever else we need to do. So what else do we want to do? Well, we want to print out the value we changed again. So let's just copy paste this and we'll paste this down there. And then it's going to print out the new value, right? So we're going to print out hello up here. We're going to make a change to test. We're going to wait until that transaction is mined. And then we're going to print out the new value. So hello and then test. But let's also make sure that our stuff up here is working, right? So we changed the default account we're using to be this second one here that ends in 4B. Let's make sure that change worked as well. So how can we do that? Well, we saw how to view transactions in the last video, right? So let's just grab that code. When we were signing transactions, we viewed the hex version of our transaction hash, and then we printed out get transaction, which I think actually needs this dot ETH here. So we'll just put that here right now. Let's grab this and we'll paste it right into our code. Right here. And then let's change this to TX underscore hash because we have a different variable name. So what happens now is we should print out hello. Then we should print out or we should change it to test. We should then grab our transaction, wait for it to finish. And then we will grab our transaction hash, print that out. Then we will grab our transaction view that is using our second account. And then we will view the change to the blockchain on the storage, which should now say test. So we just did a whole bunch of stuff here and we haven't even finished up or got started here. So let's print this out and see what happens. So here's what we got. Wait for transaction. Did you mean wait for retransaction receipt? So I probably just uh, typed this out wrong. I probably misspelled it. R-E-C-E-I-P-T. So what do we got here? Yeah, I put I-E-P-T. So we'll just fix that there really quick and then we should work just fine. 
All right. So here we go. And it says test, test because we changed it up here to hello before we got an error. So here is, let me go like this here. So we have connected to the blockchain. We have our two addresses. Then it says test because we already changed it previously in our last transaction right here before we got the error. And then it prints out the transaction and we can see where is our from address here. Here's our from address and this ends in 4B, which should be our second account because we set that as default and it is, so that is working correctly. It's good to verify. And then now here's the new value test that we change of the storage and memory. So that's all working perfectly. Now we know how to make a change on the blockchain with a transaction. We also know how to view that stored memory that we shouldn't have access to. So that's pretty awesome. What are we gonna do next? Let's also show again how to do a call just like we did in the chain link contract, but on our own local one to show that it works the same way. So what can we call in this contract? Well, if we scroll all the way to the bottom, there's a get balance function. And all it does is return a UIN, right? It doesn't make any changes, so it's perfect for us to test this dot call with. So let's say print, and we are gonna print out our target, which is the contract connection we put above, dot functions, dot get balance. And then what do we have to do? We have to do a call just like we did in the chain link contract. And we gotta put those parentheses after it. If you forget those parentheses, you will get an error. So let's run this. And we should get back a zero because we didn't deposit anything, and we did. Here's a zero right here. Perfect, so everything's working great. Now, I'm gonna cut this video off right here before it gets crazy, crazy long, and we'll continue it in the part two of the same video, which will come out like 15 minutes after this video. It'll be ready for you before you're done. So let's hop into it in a minute here. Let me stop this.